its long involvement with various aerospace companies, who he says were responsible for reverse engineering recovered spacecraft from advanced German programs and extraterrestrials. He also claims to have been in direct contact with a group of human-looking ETS he calls the Nordics. Tompkins' testimony confirms much of Corey Good's accounts, which have been described in detail within the Cosmic Disclosure series. Summarized Notes of Tompkins on the 20 and Back Program Tompkins was unaware of Good, Tompkins is not internet savvy and was not aware of Corey Good when he authored his book, Selected by Extraterrestrials. The accounts presented therein corroborate much of what Good has brought forward. Moon Base and University, Tompkins says that thousands of people joined the 20 and back SSP or what he calls the Space Navy for a 20-year tour. After entering the program, they were evaluated physically and mentally and went to facilities on the moon that were set up as staging areas for other missions. The facilities there acted like a university, providing a venue for further education and expansion of specific fields that they intended to develop as part of their contribution to the program. Mars and Jupiter Moon Facilities The Space Navy recruits high-level persons to Mars and Jupiter Moon Facilities. Space Navy Assignment and Ships Classes Afterward, they are assigned to particular base. From there, Recruits would be committed to a naval cruiser, carrier, or attack vessel in space. The naval spacecraft carriers were 1, 2, and 4 km long ships. There were and presently are 8 battle groups, comprising a complement of each type of craft along with many support vessels. Assignment Types Most of the recruits did tour on the spacecraft carriers. But some also worked on support ships. Still, Others worked on supply ships. End of tour and age regression, memory wiping, and time travel, after their 20-year tour, recruits could sign up for another 20 years or choose to go back to Earth. Those who decided to go back to Earth were age regressed. This would take anywhere from weeks to months, being returned back to the age of 21 when they left. Although Tompkins does not explicitly state time travel back to the point they left Earth, he implies as much when saying that the recruits were deposited back to a point they were taken from. Their friends and family did not age 20 years. 90% of the recruits' memories in space were removed. No contact with Earth during the tour, the recruits were not allowed to contact Earth during their tour of duty which was a standard practice in the program to prevent temporal distortion issues once a recruit was regressed and returned to their temporal point of origin. Summarized Notes of Wilcock and Good's Discussion of the 20 and Back Program Good confirms Tompkins' testimony, Good says he did not think a lot of people had access to this information. He is excited and a little shocked to hear so much corroborating testimony coming from someone he did not personally brief. Thousands of recruits, Good confirms that to his knowledge thousands of people joined the 20 and back program. Mars vs. Lunar Operation Command, LOC Tompkins said that the recruits chose their area of specialization and that Mars seems to have had facilities for this purpose. But Good's account differs in that he was taken to the LOC for his training, not Mars. Good says, like in the commonplace Navy, Different training programs and facilities are used to ensure the best training was available, providing an example of deep space telemetry as a training subject. Once done, the recruit would rejoin their unit and now have the skill set needed to perform their duties. Good is not aware of any reception area on Mars like what he recalls from the LOC. My Lab vs. Recruits Good says that the Space Navy is an enlisted branch of service whereas MILABs are taken from a civilian population. As such, there are probably differences in training and how persons are treated, such as scientists. The key difference is that MILABs are forced to go to some degree, but not in all cases, whereas Navy recruits sign up for service, presuming they are pre-selected or qualify in some way. Wilcox insider Henry Deacon and Mars Population, 
Wilcox says that an insider he had access to, Henry Deacon, told him that on Mars there was a facility with over 200,000 personnel and that it was rapidly expanding. Deacon also said that only 10,000 of the population were Earth-born humans. Good adds that during the brain drain era, people were brought into various programs and their progeny are likely living on many bases, comprising a large population after generations of time, like what Deacon told Wilcock. Eight battle groups, Good confirms that there were indeed eight battle groups, which was during the Solar Warden era. According to Good, most of these battle groups are still in service but vary in complement of carriers, destroyers, supply ships, and different kinds of support craft. These groups were made up of the same range of vessels but with different orders and missions. The general framework of the battle group was essentially the same but tailored for each mission or assignment. A battle group worked autonomously with respect to other groups, but they could be called in to support each other from time to time. Some of these groups went behind the moon strategically hiding from civilian ground-based and satellite observatories on Earth. Good cannot recall the names of any of the battle groups and also says they did not interact with other ships in his fleet. The number of vessels in each group varied depending on the mission. But usually there were at least a dozen larger vessels in each group, with higher numbers of support vessels depending on what the mission was. Encounters of the battle groups, Good says that some of the battle groups did have encounters that resulted in the damage and loss of ships that needed to be repaired for extended periods of time. In the beginning, before learning that the area around Jupiter and Saturn were off-limits, several major encounters resulted in massive losses and damage. These were from non-terrestrial weapon systems. Certain planets and planetoids in the solar system are off-limits and if battle groups accidentally or purposely violated the territory, they would be attacked. Some of the non-terrestrials used torsion-style weaponry that would cause substantial damage by twisting the craft in on itself. In such cases, the craft had to be taken apart and repaired. Correspondences with the 1980s Solar Warden Program Good and Tompkins' timeline for the beginning of the program matches. In addition, Star Trek, the next generation also came out in the 80s, suggesting that it was a partial disclosure of the Solar Warden program. Good says that most likely defense contractors were in communication with the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate, ICC, relaying data points so they could be symbolically represented to the public in various forms like TV shows. Hiding things in plain sight is a common practice for secret projects, for a number of reasons, discussed below. Tompkins' testimony is accurate, Good says that with the credentials Tompkins has, and what he has brought forward with his testimony, it is unlikely that Tompkins is fabricating information. The 20 and back program, Good says that from what he knows, the SSP had been planning to develop the program for some time, but it wasn't fully implemented until the 1980s, which corresponds with Tompkins' testimony. And Tompkins probably meant 99% of the memories were wiped, not 90%. Furthermore, unless an individual was part of the 3%, that is somewhat resistant to the wiping, like good the accuracy of memory removal was probably more like 99.99% .99 highly effective. And even in those rare cases where memories returned, the recollections surface in dreams and are out of context with normal life, likely being ignored by such people. Military service after the 20 and back program, Good says that most people joined the service before going into the program. After coming back, they could complete their tour of duty in the normal service, like four to eight years. Multiple 20 and back attendees, Good says that some people did multiple 20 and back tours and they looked the same age he was meaning it wasn't possible to determine based on physical appearance alone how long someone had been in the program. In some cases, the memory wiping did not occur for operatives that chose to re-enlist. But when their duty from one program was classified in nature, 
memory wiping for security reasons was often done complete blank slating at the end of any stint of service. Suppression of life extension technology, Good says that cabal groups don't want life extension technology, such as age reversal, to be released to the public. Instead, they are actively pursuing plans to depopulate humanity, which has been discussed by many researchers. The cabal doesn't want full disclosure because this would mean huge numbers of people would demand age regression and advanced healing technology. Restricted access to information and earth during duty, access to earth in any capacity was heavily restricted in the programs, both outgoing communications, and incoming news or information. No knowledge of what was taking place on Earth or even what was happening in other programs was allowed. Program Entertainment, Good says that there was a lot of ping-pong being played. And Wilcock adds that Henry Deacon said personnel spent long hours playing it as well. Good says they have movie nights, but didn't attend those frequently. The movies were from the pre-enlistment time period, pre-World War II and early 50s films old enough so that no one in the program would be contaminated with new information from more modern-day films. The number of people on Earth that were blank slated, Good says that the number of people could be in the tens of thousands but not everyone did 20 years. Some engineers or scientists would only do 8 to 10 years and return to Earth, or be reassigned. Maintaining blank slating after returning to Earth, Good says that after someone returns to Earth, an NSA-like organization monitors all former participants, and in instances where programming or memory wiping breaks down, they will be recalled, debriefed, asked to recount what they remember, and then blank slated again. Suspicions of good being replaced by a clone, Wilcox says that some people in the chat rooms, possibly on Gaia.com, Suspect Good was replaced by a clone because he is more articulate in comparison to when they started the Cosmic Disclosure series in mid-2015. Good responded by saying when the series began he had undergone several surgeries, rotator cuff and bicep reconstruction, that he was taking medication for, which slowed his mental processes down. Recall that Good also said after his experience with Kari, the Inner Earth Priestess, he began a vegan diet and stopped taking all medication, which would have a marked effect on his ability to think clearly and articulate himself. William Tompkins on the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate Denial of ETS and thwarting the early space program, Tompkins says that a great number of high-level people within the programs refused to accept the fact that extraterrestrials existed. At Douglas Aircraft, TRW, and General Dynamics, top-level people thwarted the early military Solar Warden program, which had a benevolent mission so it seemed to many like Tompkins. Corporations participating in the military programs at the time had other projects that would potentially allow them to nullify the more overt programs he and others were developing. These corporate powers, using advances in space technology, developed the capacity to move off-planet to mine and exploit areas in the solar system and beyond, like the 12 closest stars near Solution Alpha Centauri was the first. Tompkins says this was for mining and extracting minerals or whatever they could for money-making purposes. Recall that Good said the ICC had a great interest in exploiting space, using less than ethical means to do so. These corporate groups, the early ICC, were paralleling the space missions for industrialization, for making money. The early ICC was using the cream of the crop technology developed by the overt and heavily compartmentalized military programs that were working under the mission of expanding into space for protection and advancing the human race with the Solar Warden program. Tompkins says greed motivated the corporate powers, and they developed anything they could to that end. It should be noted that Tompkins never refers to the ICC by name, only in deed and agenda, which is effectively equivalent to the ICC described by Good. But no clear connections to the ICC Good describes have been explicitly made by Tompkins. Summarized notes of Wilcock and Good's discussion of the interplanetary corporate conglomerate.
Good comments on Tompkins' testimony. Good is shocked by how much of what Tompkins described sounds just like the ICC he discussed before. The ICC is a corporate-run and motivated organization, an assembly of companies that support the military-industrial complex, Mike. This group formed their own breakaway secret space program he refers to as the ICC. Peace versus conquest rivalry Wilcock raises the point that Tompkins seemed to suggest there was a rivalry between contractors in the overarching program, which were not on board with the relatively benevolent mission of the Space Navy. This covered group of self-interested contractors wanted to pursue their interests namely the exploitation of space at any cost, which on Earth is referred to as conquest. Good adds that this darker conquest-driven group didn't want to be held back by the Solar Warden Command structure, which likely had a more ethical mission, like defending the Earth and related assets from threats. Good says that such breakaway groups have no oversight, even within the SSP, a kind of black budget, unacknowledged special access programs, group within the SSP itself. Technological Gaps Good restates that the ICC had access to the most advanced technology, and the Solar Warden program was reliant on these contractors for their infrastructure. As a result, the ICC breakaway group had an advantage that the overt SSP couldn't counter by and large. ICC projects and missions in other star systems, Tompkins said that the ICC-like groups he mentioned were advancing into 12 star systems close to the Sol system Wilcock asks for clarification. Good says that these other systems were inhabited and it wasn't as simple as going there and immediately beginning projects. Diplomatic relations needed to be formed, but he does not remember any such relationships. However, recall that Good's experience was heavily compartmentalized and just because he lacks knowledge of certain aspects does not mean they are untrue or don't exist. Good says he did go to a Global Galactic League of Nations, GGLN, facility on a moon around a gas giant and this moon was most likely built by the ICC. ICC Command Structure Good says the command structure for the ICC could be headquartered on Earth but that there are other operations extending far beyond the solar system. For example, an executive at TRW with over 20 years experience is an excellent candidate to manage an ICC project, what Good has previously referred to as a super board that is filled with executives from other organizations that can make decisions. Good says there is likely a high level of compartmentalization within defense contracting companies, such that selected executives know just enough to manage a project. But after they are brought on as a super board member, they are likely briefed to a higher degree. ICC Products Good says that some of the items produced by the ICC are made on Earth and shipped up into space, sometimes mixed with other components from other facilities, like the one on Mars he visited in 2015. In such cases, contractors of all sorts, whether off-world or on Earth, could be working on products that eventually go into highly advanced technologies without realizing it. How does Tompkins know what he does? Good suspects that Tompkins discovered much from his time in the service, but he also has access to high-level persons in the Navy. It appears the Navy is in a contest for power with some of these other groups. And groups within the Navy want the SSP disclosed. ICC involvement with the SSP Alliance, Good says the SSP Alliance is made up of people that broke away from different programs, some of them former ICC. Recall that the primary rallying imperative of the SSP Alliance is the higher ethical and moral goals, which are to end the deplorable activity of the darker programs. This includes, but is not limited to, the full disclosure agenda and tribunal of those who committed crimes against humanity. ICC Alliance Goals, Good says their goals are cosmic capitalism, which includes the trading of biological and technical assets to non-terrestrials for technology. The ICC is one of the groups involved in the galactic slave trade. When new technologies are received, 
they go to research and development projects that eventually filters down to other programs as needed. Wilcock counters by saying the ICC facility good visited on Mars didn't seem to be profit-driven. Good responds by saying, as an example, many of the products received in the U.S. look American and appear high-level, but in most cases, they are produced by what is effectively slave labor in other countries, using capitalist models wherein workers are provided slim wages to keep the machines of industry going. Good suggests that some of the facilities developed for high-ranking ICC people are likely very advanced. ICC facilities handed to humanity after full disclosure, Good says that many of the highly advanced ICC facilities will likely be handed to humanity after the full disclosure event. This is why the Blue Avians told the SSP Alliance to stop attacking and destroying ICC facilities on Mars. Recall the Mars atrocities from 2015. Draco and the ICC, Good says the Draco and other non-terrestrials most likely play a role in the ICC activities. But the ICC is mostly an Earth-based organization. Analysis Age Regression Programs and Volition When comparing Tompkins and Good's testimony regarding age regression there appears to be a subtle difference. Tompkins refers to a Space Navy that had volunteers who were asked to participate in the program. Good's testimony is similar in that he was recruited to volunteer himself into the program and was promised he would receive benefits after completion, but with the added element of my lab influences. According to Good's past testimony, he was participating in the secret space program as a child without his express consent and was subjected to memory wiping at that early age suggesting that this kind of service is not voluntary to the same degree as the Space Navy program Tompkins speaks of. But Good also said that the age regression program seems to require memory wiping as part of an agreement between the SSP and the group that provided the technology to them. It could be that there is some universal law principle being upheld, which Wilcock has discussed in the past. Good does not explicitly state that he volunteered to have his memory wiped. In fact, the implication from his testimony is that he didn't know about this line item in the agreement he made, but this remains unconfirmed by him directly. Hiding the truth in plain sight and universal law Briefly, from a lawful perspective, free will is one of the primary principles of creation. Thus, the mechanics of how free will beings interact with each other is the foundation of all exchanges or energy within the creation. On Earth, contracts are the basis for understanding the synergies of free will beings and the rules of manifestation, universal law, what has sometimes been referred to as magic. Contracts or agreements are not just words on paper these are merely receipts for a metaphysical dynamic in consciousness. When one associates with another, in any capacity, a contract is in place. The idea being, while the cabal seems to have no moral compass whatsoever, they do need to acknowledge universal law or they would invite intervention from various positive forces. Part of this appears to be the disclosure of program details in works of fiction albeit in an obscure way. In doing so, they provide a level of notice to the people, which have been informed of their machinations even though most of us think we have been fully deceived. While notice in this regard obviously is lacking because what is received within the mind of the people is not functionally equivalent to the data within a cabal member's mind. Meaning, the disclosure through fiction notice wouldn't constitute an actual bona fide disclosure, meeting of the minds, in a court of true law on earth but it does seem to satisfy universal law to some degree which on the surface seems perplexing. Spiritual Evolution and Personal Responsibility In an effort to understand how the Cabal seems to use this loophole to their advantage, we will need to consider the goals of spiritual evolution and the responsibility of each individual. In short, there are no such things as dualistic, black and white, victim-abuser relationships each individual is partially responsible for what manifests collectively. This culpability crosses into the spiritual realm, meaning as part of our evolutionary journey in life, 
we might have agreed to be the victim of this or that situation to provide ourselves or another person a venue for spiritual growth. What better way to learn the importance of forgiveness than agree to be abused in a life experience? Of course, this is a controversial subject to many because almost no one has a memory of the spiritual contract negotiation of what they agreed to do in this life. Also, the traumatized ego would rather believe in pure victimhood, and therefore avoid personal growth, than to consider they decided to play a part in what happened during their incarnation. The overarching goal of the universe appears to be soul growth of the individual via experience and catalyzation. Thus, there is a careful balance and ministry for each individual such that everyone is always experiencing precisely what is the best for them to grow spiritually. This is why so-called random life events are not random at all if one is willing to look at the greater meanings of such things. In relation to disclosure and notice, reality itself provides the first level of primary disclosure, another notice furnished by the cabal likely ensures that a secondary notice won't come from other sources, like benevolent extraterrestrials. The law of one material, in particular, suggests that seeking for knowledge, in and of itself, ensures that someone or something will act as a courier seek and ye shall find. And the first right of duty in this regard would be the people closest to the seeking party, and the ones who helped manifest the contract the cabal. In other words, parties to a contract have the first duty to full disclosure and notice, and the contracts of interest here are those agreements implied by the collectively manifested reality. Spiritual forces or extraterrestrials cannot overstep the cabal or the people to force disclosure because this would violate the contract. If the goal of spiritual evolution is a self-mastered sovereign individual, then the universe and the high spiritual agencies within it are beholden to provide experiences that facilitate that purpose. This includes the third density experience where individuals mingle and provide each other experiences for growth. The illusion of deception appears to be a major aspect of this catalyzing process. The poisoning of food and ineffectiveness of the medical system are good examples. Self-evident truth, notice of wrongdoing, and culpability. The fruit of eating poor quality foods is disease and poor health. Anyone who cares to dispel their own illusions about these deceptions can do so merely by contemplating their own experience. And yet, Scores of people all over the planet continue to fall for the deceptions of food and the medical system. From a spiritual growth perspective, easily understood within the context of a contract, a purchaser of a McDonald's meal has enough experience within their life to suspect that eating such food is not good for them. These deleterious effects can be used to trigger the truth-seeking drive so that the individual gains more precise knowledge to eventually know without question that fast food is not healthy. In other words, when a person suffers from eating poor food they bear the most culpability and as such, the burden of change rests firmly on their shoulders. Even if McDonald's admitted to pushing poison food, this won't change the damage that has already been done the person would have to take up that healing work on their own as a karmic correction for their own actions. In a similar way, all the machinations of the cabal, although not clearly revealed to the people, are indirectly self-evident within experience itself. The primary reason why the truth remains unseen from the people is not because it isn't available it's because the people aren't actively looking. Thus. From a spiritual evolution perspective, the karma created from self-imposed ignorance can only be alleviated by the individual themselves. In this way, as long as the cabal disclosure the truth in some fashion they place the burden of truth unveiling on the people. And since the people have largely chosen to remain ignorant, they suffer in the pitfalls of their own making. But to be clear, the fact that the burden of truth and change rests largely on the people's shoulders does not also mean the cabal bear no culpability. It is just that the people are more culpable than the cabal in realizing the truth as individuals, and then as a collective, gathering to change the situation. If one considers the principles of causality this makes perfect sense. 
Ignorance of personal responsibility leads to karmic correction and suffering. Imagine a man handing out bad candy in a public place. You observe that when someone eats the candy, they smile with pleasure from the taste but then quickly double over with stomach pain. The man is culpable for offering bad candy, but the people who eat it are more culpable because their choice was the initiating action as they chose to eat the candy even though everyone who did got an upset stomach. Thus, the chain of causality clearly shows that without someone choosing to eat the candy, the bad candy cannot create the effect of feeling an upset stomach. Stated another way, the man's offer of bad candy would not cause any pain if the people simply chose not to eat it after watching the first person get sick. They chose to eat the candy despite data within their experience compelling them to think more carefully. The causal factors were both an offering of the candy and an acceptance of what was offered, with the latter action being a higher order component. The universal laws of causality and free will are balanced in that one's choice to remain ignorant in an attempt to blame others for their own misfortune invites karmic corrections. In essence, the universe wants us to honor all our creations and choices, not just the ones we choose to focus on. And therefore, the pandemic hardships of collective ignorance is dolled out to the individual. This is why trying to ignore negative things only makes the problem worse, as the part we need to play in correcting it cannot be recognized or acted upon. Assuming the aforementioned analysis of causality, culpability and universal law is correct, there are a large number of collective hardships made possible by humanity's indifference and ignorance, such as pedophilia human trafficking, pandemic disease, war, environmental destruction, and so much more. Accordingly, only when, as a people, we care enough about each other so that when one person is harmed we all feel compassion, will the social diseases we tend to blame on the cabal be recognized as a symptom of a holistic and collective problem. Coordination between SSP and Astronomers Good said that various battle groups hide behind the moon to avoid detection from satellites. If Tompkins and Good are to be believed, there are huge numbers of spacecraft flying about in the solar system at any given time, whether of extraterrestrial or SSP origin. But how is it that almost no photographs or images have been captured by astronomers and observatories, assuming that these crafts are not cloaked or invisible? Some might contend that the lack of photographic evidence supports the assertion that there are no such SSBs. But it could also be that a large and far-reaching coordination effort has been taking place behind the scenes. Consider that according to a report produced by James E. David, author of the book Spies and Shuttles since the beginning of the space agency's inception, it was actively involved with intelligence services like the CIA and NSA under the guise of Cold War secrecy. NASA's reputation within ufology circles colorfully regard the NASA acronym meaning never a straight answer and several whistleblowers have come forward alleging that images have been manipulated to hide various things, including SSP and non-terrestrial spacecraft. Furthermore, most high-quality telescopes and observatories are well protected by various academic and governmental gatekeepers to such an extent that only certain individuals ever gain access. And the quality of telescopes available to the public is presumably not advanced enough to present a problem for SSBs. But it would stand to reason that those institutions and persons who do have access to imaging technology capable of tracking extraterrestrial and SSP craft would need to be heavily controlled. And that whichever intelligence service is in charge of managing telescope time, coordinates with the SSP to ensure no spacecraft are in the line of sight. Thus, there is likely an umbrella organization that knows the whereabouts of every SSP asset in space so that it can work in concert with ground-based intelligence services with the goal of maintaining secrecy even from military-industrial complex organizations of a lower level capacity, like the NRO. Science Fiction, Hiding the Truth in Plain Sight As was discussed above, the Cabal has a long history of hiding the truth in plain sight. 
The rise of science fiction after the Second World War likely was part of covered efforts to disclose secret programs and projects to the public. As an example of this, consider the Face on Mars comic book by Jack Kirby. As one possible example of disclosure through fiction, Jack Kirby is a comic book artist who produced many widely successful works during the mid to late 20th century. Kirby wrote The Face on Mars depicting a giant human visage on the surface of the Red Planet in 1958. But it wasn't until 1976 when NASA's Viking mission sent back photos of the Cydonia site that the public learned of a landform that some believe is a clear-cut case of an extraterrestrial civilization. Although NASA and the media were quick to refute claims that this image was proof of the existence of non-terrestrials, it fueled a storm of interest in the notion that humanity is not alone in the universe. Ufologists would spend years trying to solve this mystery, all while most of the public remained completely unaware of this staggering correlation. Did Kirby know that the face on Mars existed? If so, how did he come to gain this knowledge? Some researchers contend that Kirby was provided the data by certain figures within a secretive space program that had already made the voyage to Mars decades before NASA would set its sights there. If true, then this suggests what breakaway civilization and secret space program researchers have asserted for years that there is indeed a hidden agenda to explore space that was successful beyond the wildest dreams of many who subscribe to NASA's contemporary plans for Mars exploration. One whistleblower claims that the Germans developed a hidden program to produce anti-gravity flying saucers as early as 1930, some 30 years before Kirby would pen his infamous comic book work. But again, for the average person, these claims are so controversial that many dismiss them out of hand, without a second thought that they might actually be true. Briefly, there are several advantages to disclosing program details into the public. There is a cosmic law component, which was already discussed above. Additionally, there is a psychological warfare aspect. When information is presented to the public under the guise of fiction, any truth it contains is regarded as fiction and thus even if a whistleblower comes forward or documents are revealed, most people will not take them seriously. The very popular TV series Star Trek, The Next Generation, which as Wilcox said, was released in concert with the 20 and back Solar Warden program during the 1980s, suggests it was used as a disclosure through fiction tool. As will now be discussed, in order to maintain secrecy, using an obfuscated disclosure campaign alongside real programs is needed to prevent the public from spontaneously gaining knowledge of it through telepathic means. This idea of telepathic revelation in the general population is somewhat fringe keeping secrets of a large magnitude is not an easy thing. Due to the fact that through the collective consciousness mechanisms inherent within coherent systems of energy and consciousness, the brain-earth-mind connection, information can spontaneously become known or be received by people who have never been in contact with elements of secret projects. As a result, if there wasn't a coordinated disclosure through fiction campaign happening, the public would eventually become aware of hidden truths as a function of morphogenetic osmosis, for lack of a better term. Dr. Michael Persinger, a researcher who helped create the Corin Helmet, popularly known as the God Helmet. He presented evidence during a 2007 talk he gave at Laurentian University that during times of quiescent geomagnetic activity, information can emerge into a person's mind, especially during dreams and theta states. While the receiving party may not understand specific details, the data is still there and will eventually form a coherent narrative if left unchecked. If one considers the properties of the morphogenetic field, as described by Rupert Sheldrake, then there is enough evidence to suggest that all secrets could eventually become known through spontaneous telepathy or intuitive knowing. In an effort to address this problem of maintaining secrecy on the part of the cabal, there are several solutions to draw from. By providing a facsimile of secretive data to the public within works of fiction, an anchor for the data can be subtly implanted into the minds of the masses in a controllable way. 
In this regard, when individuals telepathically receive data in a spontaneous manner, it will likely be assumed by this person that they are merely recalling aspects of what they saw in a work of science fiction. This would cause a normalization effect within the population at large wherein people who do in fact receive real intuitive information in a remote viewed fashion never consider their insights to be anything more than random thoughts. And finally, because of social engineering programs destined to destroy autonomy and critical thinking, even if someone does start to consciously realize they are receiving truthful information, they will likely never tell anyone because it is socially taboo. All of these things provide self-policing layers of obfuscation and information control as part of the social fabric and culture of society itself. What's more, the subconscious can be influenced to produce dream and intuitive experiences that are equivalent to spontaneously received data. In other words, by using disclosure through fiction tactics, it muddies the waters of intuitive insight and leads people to believe that what they imagine within their mind space has no association with reality, when in fact, there are profound correlations. And if researchers like Dr. Persinger and Sheldrake are correct, so-called random mind chatter and images in dreams and theta states might contain a wealth of very real telepathically received data points. Disclosure through fiction is arguably one of the most effective programs for maintaining the SSP, and other covered projects, in the history of mass mind control. As a side note, this phenomenon of telepathic or spontaneously received information on the part of the public could explain why so many people claim to have been abducted or been involved in SSP's good has said in the past that there are many people who say they remember things and that they could be former 20 and back participants. No doubt some of these people are outright frauds but perhaps others, the vast majority, are recipients of telepathically derived data gleaned during their dream time and theta states. It appears our minds are much more connected to each other and reality than we have been led to believe. Suppression of healing and age regression technology for the transhumanist slash AI agenda. Good said that the shadowy forces behind the SSP do not want advanced healing technology to be revealed to the public, likely because they want to further the depopulation agenda. In addition to that goal, also consider that in order to convince the public to accept the transhumanist agenda and eventual takeover of a benevolent artificial intelligence, AI, to manage society, the false premise of humanity's incompetence, imperfection and diseased state must be fiercely maintained. So long as people think that life has no overarching purpose and that the universe is a random mash of material things with no spiritual leanings, the agenda will be seen as a good thing. Arguably there are many branches to the false reality mechanism, but the focus of this discussion is the fact that most people are led to believe the human organism is a flawed and broken thing. This is an essential bias to maintain within the public mind to create a desire for solutions that correct an illusory problem. As David Icke would put it, this is a classic problem-slash-reaction-solution situation, likely involving the intentional destruction of the ecosystem poisoning of the food supply, and corruption of the medical system so that the miracle of transhumanism will be widely accepted once it is finally revealed to the public something that seems to be fast approaching. Greedy Goals of the ICC Both Tompkins and Good discuss the greedy aims and intentions of the ICC, but as was just reviewed, there are likely other goals in mind. When one has the ability to print money without limit, the desire to earn more and more of it is no longer meaningful for those within the matrix of the financial system. This suggests that either the ICC is populated at the highest levels with those who are still manipulated by the enticement of monetary gain, and slash or that there is another agenda. As was just implied, the cabal needs to maintain a false version of reality in order to produce a well-mind-controlled population that can be enticed to act as pawns in the system. And since compartmentalization is an essential part of the cabal's efforts, lower-level operatives who do not have access to limitless money would be motivated by monetary gains. Enticing contractors to maintain secrecy by offering large profit margins is one way to do this, 
which helps hide the existence of mining facilities operated by the ICC elsewhere in the universe. But for the ICC at large, money is simply a means to an end. And since money is not used in space, according to good, trade of technology and resources becomes the currency of the cosmos. Thus, the acquisition of any and all things is a generally good overarching goal so that all manner of things can be stored away in the event they may be used for future trade deals. Secrecy, Space Navy Contest, and the ICC Tompkins suggested that the Space Navy's mission was of a benevolent nature, likely used to garner support from those brought into the program. Similarly, Good said that many people in the brain drain were recruited under the guise of maintaining the continuity of the human race that this was a noble and honorable task that required secrecy. Both of these overt mission statements would compel an ethical person comply with aspects of the secrecy agenda. But, a deeper more covered agenda was hidden underneath this one, which is the exploitation or conquest of space. During the 15th century, the Catholic Church's doctrine of discovery formed the basis of the Western expansion, which is still used to this day. It claimed that in order to save all the souls on earth, all people must be subjected to the Roman pontiff. Incorporation of nations, which occurs via letters patent, treaties and constitutions, connect to the Vatican, on one level, because these founding documents do not rebut the papal pull unam sanctam. 1302 CD, by Pope Boniface VIII, which states, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. But obviously the beneficent salvation promised by such a public rallying cry was and is a fraud as below so above. The Solar Warden Program and Space Navy's overt mission, along with the decades of research that went with it, seemed to be a platform for insidious goals of space conquest to be realized. While teams of people advanced technology and exploration to a staggering degree, often with incredible compartmentalization so that no one ever fathoms how far things had progressed the shadowy figures behind the programs advanced their true agenda. Thus, the ICC's motivations are effectively equivalent to the Vatican's doctrine of conquest and imperialism. But even with the best secrecy and compartmentalization methods, people within the Space Navy became aware of the darker agenda. Good says that the Solar Warden program was dependent on corporate contractors for their essential infrastructure and technology, which made it difficult to counter any nefarious agenda without compromising themselves. This means that, for some time, it is possible the morally motivated people within the SSBs were likely gathering support for their eventual move to counter the nefarious agenda. In short, the SSP Alliance's moral imperative was quietly gathering support for decades, and if good is to be believed, it only recently became active through the SSP Alliance. There could still be white hats within the darker SSBs and Mike waiting to make moves to end the current systems of oppression. Slave labor through capitalism and the financial system. It is no secret that the financial system is presently and historically used as a form of free-range slavery. People who are unaware of this fact would likely argue it is simply a method of exchanging goods and services that is superior to barter and trade systems. But at present, Billions of people on Earth directly participate in the machinations of the cabal through the financial system. Even the most morally and ethically driven people are forced to put their energy into the insidious agenda of the shadow government because everyone needs to earn a living. And in concert with the disclosure through fiction technique used by the cabal, consider the following. The theory of financial enslavement seems to be so widely accepted by a growing body of researchers it is openly revealed in pop culture like the TV series Rick and Morty. Free Range Slavery, Draco and the ICC The Draco, which also seem to be referred to as crusaders in the law of one, prefer autonomous service to self-organizations, wherein they don't need to expend personal resources to receive benefits. 
This is one reason why free-range slavery systems like the financial paradigm are so essential to service to self-parasitic groups. The philosophy of conquest and enslavement through self-policing autonomous organizations is most likely their greatest contribution to the ICC and by extension the Earth's Babylonian money magic system, dating back millennia. As such, the Draco may exercise a degree of management and control over the ICC, but it is the greed and philosophy of elitism, pushed onto the Earth thousands of years ago, which acts as the greatest influence. In a way, the ICC itself is a product of social programming of elitism and separation, a seed that was planted within humanity eons ago. The ICC and those motivated by conquest, are just as mind-controlled as the general population who clamor for gadgets and a step up the social ladder, never realizing that the whole system is enshrouded by a self-policing slavery model. How slaves sacrifice their autonomy in favor of comforts and illusory power, and the cabal seems to have fallen for this trick long ago. But before the financial system and the service to self mindset that it breeds can be changed, the people must be deprogrammed or shown a better way. Monetary systems help destroy public trust through greed and dishonorable actions. All one need do is look at the destruction of indigenous peoples in the Americas, most of which did not have a concept of absolute ownership or money, to realize that it is very easy to ruin public trust through doctrines and ideas that go unquestioned by the public. The concept of ownership and our relationship to ourselves, others, and the environment must be redefined. Thus, some form of a transitional monetary system will likely be needed, one ideally based on truth, honor, and transparency to end the artificial scarcity paradigm and slowly allow the human family to heal.